So I'm sure more people will just um, keep coming in, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Austin DSA's May general meeting. Uh, my name is Ana Perez. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm one of your co-chairs. So whether this is your first meeting or your hundredth, uh, this is a place where you'll hear rousing political speeches, get updates on ongoing political work in the chapter, and learn about upcoming events. Um, over the past year, we've seen tremendous growth in our movement. We had Bernie Sanders presidential runs, um, global catastrophes like the pandemic and mass uprisings like last summer's Black Lives Matter resurgence uh, have laid bare the cracks in our neoliberal capitalist system and really driven home to people, I think, the need for collective action beyond the ballot box. Over the past few months, DSA has made over 700,000 dials across Arizona, Maine, West Virginia, and Virginia um, to do the PRO Act, pass the PRO Act campaign. We've talked with thousands of people about why we need to pass the PRO Act to rebuild a fighting labor movement and got them to action, um, to do actions with us to pressure their senators uh, to support the bill. We flipped Senator Angus King of Maine and Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia to support the PRO Act, which is really a testament to what we can accomplish when we organize together. Uh, like I said earlier, today we'll be voting on our chapter's delegates to attend the biennial national convention where our national organization will adopt its first political platform ever and define our goals for the next two years. So it's truly an exciting time to join DSA and get involved and organize uh, in the fight to win working class power. Uh, however, our movement is at a pivotal point in its development, and we can't afford to be complacent or rest on our victories. Uh, the left is right now punching above its weight rhetorically. You know, we've seen the Biden administration make concessions on issues like waiving intellectual property rights of the COVID vaccines um, abroad or in waning support for Israel's apartheid state. But rhetoric is not enough. Um, until we see the government backing vaccine production across the globe financially, until we see federal funding for Israel's missiles dry up, we still have more work to do. Uh, we've seen Biden likened to FDR because of the massive stimulus package, but we know that this one-time injection of money into the economy is not enough. And already big media outlets are pushing tired lies about worker shortages and lazy minimum wage earners collecting pandemic unemployment instead of going back to work. We know that these headlines are complete bullshit, that workers and their families are being squeezed between lost income during COVID, medical bills, back rent, and so many other expenses imposed on working people just trying to survive. All while venture capitalists made more money than ever before during the pandemic. But you know what? The bosses are scared. Uh, we also saw Amazon scramble to suppress a union drive in Bessemer, Alabama. And here in Texas, we've seen 650 United Steelworkers at Beaumont's ExxonMobil plant locked out because the management is scared of a strike. Um, while workers in Austin and Dallas closed, in, closed down juice land shops demanding better working conditions. Um, we've seen deep pocketed Republicans attack our past wins like decriminalizing homelessness through local campaigns like Prop B and the state um, trying to make legislation that would undermine our local power. So, uh, you know, the question then is what is to be done? It can feel like a really overwhelming environment to organize in, especially as the economy and the media um, and people generally just try to make us forget that the pandemic, the statewide blackout, the uprisings, just try to forget that ever happened and go back to quote unquote normal. But as socialists, we know that we derive power from our collective struggle. We have tens of thousands of new members across the country, and they all want to find their place in the movement. So if you're struggling to figure out how to contribute, um, you're definitely not alone. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm co-chair, but it took me a year to figure out that you don't really need some special skill or um, special political knowledge to do this work. And I challenge everyone on this call 
to sign up and attend one of the many committee meetings or actions that you'll hear about later in the announcements and also to reach out to at least one comrade who you see doing work in the chapter that you really um, appreciate or vibe with. And even, even if you just wanna organize a social event, um, talking to each other one-on-one -on -one and developing politically together is a huge first step in building our chapter and organizing the working class of Austin and you know the world writ large. So um, yeah, also if planning socials is your thing, uh, there's a new committee forming for that, uh, planning and logistics committee, and you can join it by joining the channel on Slack or looking out for its first meeting on the calendar. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul to give us some updates about what happened with our May Day rally for the PRO Act. Hey, y'all. Um, I'm Paul Steiner. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm an Austin DSA member and a member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local 520. So uh, on May 2nd, not quite May Day, but you know we had an election then, so we kind of moved it. So that, but uh, we had a rally at the Texas AFL-CIO Hall and uh, marched on down to Ted Cruz's office uh, to quote unquote demand that he sign on to the PRO Act. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, getting Ted Cruz a Republican, one of the most vicious anti-labor parties uh, to quite honestly ever exist in, in the world, uh, you know, that's a dead letter. But the most, in, the more important part of this was that was uh, getting us involved, getting DSA to link up with the existing organized labor movement in Texas. Uh, you know, part of my favorite part, one of my favorite parts of the rally was that we had, you know, probably more union members there than DSA members. And, you know, that's an important part towards uh, merging the socialist movement with the working class of America and, forging uh, the workers' movement into, a, uh, into something that can actually win socialism in this country. And, uh, you know, uh, that's a vital step towards that. It's going to be a long project, but it's a necessary part. And, uh, you know, as one of the biggest opportun one of the biggest wins for me personally was that, you know, uh, we have a rank and file core group uh, in, the, in the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And we're constantly talking about how to organize more, how to reform our union to be more democratic and more militant. And uh, you know, from that event, we recruited two new new people who were interested in that project. And that's how we build a you know dedicated socialist movement in this country that has the power to change this country for the better and for and permanently. And, uh, you know, that's what I was the most proud of. So, you know, I thought it was a huge success. It was a wonderful day. And, uh, you know, we got to march through, uh, march through and uh, ask for a labor party and ask uh, Ted Cruz to pass the PRO Act. Uh, Jeff Glass, I will hand it off to, and he can talk about uh, next steps. And, uh, yeah. Hey, thanks, Paul. Hi, y'all. I'm Jeff. Uh, he, him pronouns. Um, I'm a member of the Green New Deal Campaign Committee for DSA, which uh, has been coordinating with the Democratic Socialist Labor Commission, um, the PRO Act campaign. So the PRO Act campaign has been phase one of our Green New Deal campaign, uh, which we launched um, in January of this year. Uh, kind of three phase campaign. I'll talk about the next phase in a second. Um, so we last year organized a big strategy summit and then worked with a 20 person team to develop a strategy that would work uh, under current conditions, which we all remember last year, what those included. Um, we partnered with DSLC on this first phase to pass the PRO Act um, to campaign on it the first 100 days of the Biden administration. Uh, the NPC, that's the National Political Committee, the head political body of DSA, passed a resolution in February making that campaign DSA's highest external priority uh, through May. And uh, that culminated in the May Day weekend 
uh, and rallies um, across the country. I think more than 80 chapters participated in that. And um, it was a really, really exciting thing to see DSA come together in that way uh, and similar ways to what Paul uh, was talking about. So I'm just gonna hit a couple of highlights of what the campaign has done um, um, over its course in the last few months. So Anna talked about the 800,000 calls to patch through voters to their senators, we're flipping two, and um, that's not over yet. I'm dropping in the chat a sign up. Uh, for more, we're going to make more calls, try to hit a million. We also set up a bunch of national teams and built a Slack with over, over 3,700 people in it. We trained and provided resources to 80 chapters to run rallies on May Day. Thank you, Leah. We trained, coached, and provided resources to chapters to do local union outreach on PRO Act. That was a lot of some of what we did here. I think four or five unions were represented at our May Day rally, um, May 2nd rally. And all this work, we've really seen it revitalize chapters across the country, especially chapters, smaller chapters, especially in target states. And we've also seen it re-engage a lot of DSA members who were not, um, who were not moving for obvious reasons. We created, uh, we recruited and absorbed new members. We raised a bunch of money to pay for campaign expenses. And what, to me, the most exciting thing about this, aside from the chapter revitalization, has been creating a model for DSA-wide campaigning on a legislative issue, uh, coordinated all the way to chapter level and across formations in chapters, as well as co coordinated across national formations, right? Like DSLC, GNDCC, and um, uh, GDC. Um, and all this was done, well, I forgot to say, while we're working in a big external coalition with two major unions, IUPAT, the Painters Union, and CWA uh, 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 Communication Workers. So, and that coalition, I really believe in DSA as a powerful force within it, has really pushed AFL and other major unions to throw down harder behind the PRO Act, to do some major spending, and to actually call for filibuster reform. So. Uh, the next phase of the campaign starts now this weekend, the NPC um, approved in spirit our uh, second phase of the campaign, which brings proactive organizing into the infrastructure fight in Congress that's going on now and developing. Um, Biden asked the PRO Act to be in his infrastructure package. And uh, so we're going to continue to do that coalition work and pressure target senators. Uh, developing new tactics, and this will coincide with the second phase of our campaign plan, the infrastructure fight, which is a democratic green stimulus uh, to bring whatever infrastructure passes more in line with our socialist vision. So that means much more investment. That means much more investment in public goods like schools, housing, transit, and energy, and uh, much more labor-oriented provisions, and um, we'll continue to expand labor outreach to new public sector unions and build capacity and relationships there. Um, that's a lot. Uh, I think Don is going to talk next about what we're doing. Yes, Alaska as well. We did uh, pivot to Burkowski a little bit. To talk about next steps, we're going to talk about planning for a local Green New Deal campaign to coordinate with the national campaign. I think Don's on the agenda. Thanks, y'all. Hey, thanks, Jeff. I'm going to, I've got a link um, uh, that's in the agenda. Here it is in the chat again. Uh, we're going to start meeting uh, this Sunday, 4 p.m., uh, virtually, of course. Uh, we're probably going to do some, some uh, a pretty robust meeting schedule over the next month or two. And what we really want to do now is, is, like Jeff is saying, we've had a lot of success nationally with the PROACT campaign. Uh, we flipped two fucking senators. That's pretty mind-blowing. Uh, and we've helped galvanize like labor and built incredibly strong coalitions with like some of the most important, like some of the largest fighting unions in the country. So good for us, God damn it. That's really good shit. So um, we're going to keep building on that. And like Jeff was saying, um, this is the next round that's really gearing up is the infrastructure bill. I think people have probably heard a lot about this. Um, there's going to be some, there's a lot of horse trading going on for an infrastructure bill. Uh, something that's really important to keep in mind here and then how that connects to the PROACT work 
Biden does did say he wants the PRO Act to go through the infrastructure bill. The reason that's important is that for a normal bill, to, if they don't do filibuster reform, you've got to get 60 votes, which is fucking impossible. Uh, if the infrastructure bill goes the way it's going, they're just going to ram it through, through, um, what is that thing called? The, the, the reconciliation, which doesn't need it. So if the PRO Act is in that, we might actually get a PRO Act. So, um, it's important to keep, you know, keep the fires hot on that one. So we're going to keep focusing on that as well. But we're also going to talk about um, uh, core infrastructure, Green New Deal infrastructure programs that are more radical than anything Biden wants to do. Uh, nationally, uh, the, the coalition's working with uh, some of the some of the Congress people in the squad to figure out like what the best thing to really push for is. Uh, there's a couple of options are going to float up. There's going to be some that are going to make sense, uh, really a lot of sense for Austin to help us kind of bridge environmental work with uh, labor organizing and make that coalition really strong and effective. Uh, probably going to wind up doing a lot of yelling at Lloyd Doggett. That's just a that's just a guess, but we'll see. It's a lot of fun. If you haven't done it before, if you haven't been in a pressure campaign with Lloyd Doggett yet, you're in DSA. You're going to. It's going to be great. Um, so there's the link again. Uh, if you want to be involved in this campaign and help kind of talk this out, think it through, and, and plan what we could do, uh, and, and and get in on the ground floor for planning what this campaign could look at, look like for the rest of the year. Come to that meeting on Sunday, 4 p.m. Uh, we want to see you there. We want to hear your ideas. We want to think about what uh, we can do both to do this nationally and both to support this national campaign with our with our own Congress people. Uh, and also if there's uh, opportunities for local campaigns we can think through that kind of reflect that, we can think about that too as we go. But we're going to be kind of coming up with a campaign uh, committee, a, a project committee proposal for this over the next few months and then come back to the uh, GBM with a fleshed out vetted idea uh, for folks to vote on. So uh, if you want to be involved in this, join. Uh, we want you, we want your participation and help us uh, come up with what this program is going to be for Austin. Wow, I'm so pumped up to get involved in this new campaign. Thanks, y'all. Um, next, we'll hear from Kim. Sweet, thanks. Um, would it be okay for, or could someone oh, set up yes. like, to share my screen? Thanks. Got you. Hi, friends. I am once again here to talk to you about abortion. Uh, no, I'm here to talk to you about Fundathon. Um, <laughs> if you have been to a general body meeting recently, you have seen me. Oh, hey, thanks for the hair shout out. Oh, hey, hi. Cool. So, um, the Feminist Action Committee has been participating in Fundathon 2021. So Fundathon is an annual fundraiser for Texas abortion funds. So abortion funds exist because anti-choice lawmakers prohibit folks who have insurance from using it for abortion and implementing policies like the Hyde Amendment that prohibit people who are on Medicaid from using it to cover their abortions. So quite simply, they do this to keep poor folks poor and to push reproductive health care choices for the from the grasp of working uh, class people, um, forcing them to start and grow families before they want to. So um, abortion funds are incredibly important, especially now in light of the new six week ban, which while likely super unconstitutional and will be fought in courts, is doing its damage because it's making people think that abortion is unattainable in Texas. But abortion is still legal and we are here to help fund it. So um, I wanted to just give a quick update about kind of what it's at, what we're doing. So we're doing it to combat abortion stigma, to raise money for abortion funds, but also to talk to people that we know and love about our vision of socialism and reproductive justice. Um, so reproductive justice is a framework. Um, it talks about the right for people, for all people to be able to have or not have a family and to be able to live in a safe and healthy environment. So this is sort of like the framework that we use um, looking towards Fundathon. So um, we had some goals when we set out. We wanted to have three to five teams, um, leaders to engage people about socialist feminism, reproductive justice, and abortion. We wanted to bring in 15 new members to Austin DSA, seven new folks into the Feminist Action Caucus, and to try to raise $10,000, which, while sounding like a lot of money, is roughly only enough to cover about 20 first trimester abortions because abortion is hella expensive guys <laughs> so um we wanted to kind of give a quick timeline um so 
this year, we started uh, fundraising in March. We held a relational organizing training to teach folks how to talk to their loved ones about abortion and bring them into this work. Um, we had a crafternoon, which was really um, a social event um, to create our work together and to build relationships, um, especially ones that were previously like online only. Um, we got an extension for Fundathon, which is amazing. Um, so you can actually donate until May 31st. You've got a couple more days um, to help us uh, raise as much money as we can for Texas abortion funds who, as we know, so desperately need it right now. And then I also wanted to announce that on June 4th, we are going to have an outdoors distance but in-person trivia night and wrap-up party. Um, we're still picking out what the location for that is going to be. Ideally, we're looking at something like a park that's accessible um, because we don't want anyone to have to like be forced to pay for anything in order to attend. Um, but keep uh, an eye out for some deets on that. Um, I wanted to really quickly um, do like a early debrief. So we did get those five teams. Woo -woo. Um, we did bring in five new organizers, which is incredible. Um, so we're really excited because we also hit our fundraising goal. Thanks to y'all and to all of the hardworking organizers, we raised $10,346 for Texas Abortion Fund so far, um, which is a lot of money, y'all. This is a huge thing. And um, it means a lot to our Texas Abortion Funds that Austin DSA shows up so regularly each year um, and shows up so big. So, mwah, so great. Um, one thing that we kind of learned about what maybe um, could have been some factors in how the campaign went is that it was kind of hard um, to bring folks in um, considering the alignment between Fundathon and our Proppy campaign. Um, when it started, we anticipated them being side by side the whole time, um, and that made it a little tough to bring folks in. Um, but I think we did an amazing, amazing job. Ooh, great question, Mark. Uh, you can find all of our um, links to donate here at this here. Perfect. And it is in the agenda. Mwah, thank you, Ellie. Um, so just wanted to let y'all know about a couple of events coming up. Um, not all necessarily related to Fundathon, but still good stuff. Um, so this Saturday at 11, join us at the Capitol. Um, we are going to be raging about this most recent abortion ban um, alongside a bunch of other organizations. Um, and we're going to be at maybe doing some tabling, very likely some flyering. So that'll be super fun. Um, June 4th, Friday at 7 p.m., we'll hold that outdoor distance fundathon wrap-up event. So stay tuned on location deets. And then Tuesday, June 7th at 7, um, the Feminist Action Committee is having their monthly meeting, which anyone who identifies as a socialist feminist is welcome to come to. Um, we're going to be planning our next book club, which is going to be all about how we get free Black feminism and the Combahee River Collective. Um, so some really, really good stuff coming up. Feel free to check out that link tree. It's got all the dates, all the links. Um, and let me know if you have questions or come find us on Slack. We're at the caucus-feminist action. Cool. That's it. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Kim. Um, great job, y'all. Love to see it. Uh, next, we'll hear from Amanda about um, what the hell is going on at the state legislature. The too long don't read. It's bad, y'all. Um, but, you know, howdy. My name is Amanda Cavazos Weems. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I'm glad that Anna invited me to speak to y'all about the Texas legislature this session or at this meeting. Um, so I'm gonna talk for a bit about the bad bills we've seen and, more, and then a little bit more um, making the case for the legislature as a site of class struggle and then outlining a vision of the future of how our chapter can intervene in the Texas legislature as socialists um, in Austin as an, and in Texas. Um, for future campaigns. So I'm feeling a little misty-eyed about it because May Day actually marked my fourth year as a card-carrying socialist. Um, I joined DSA at a sit-in <laughs> at the Texas cap State Capitol during the legislative session in 2017. And when I was there, I got to meet some of my comrades um, at that sit-in protesting Texas racist show me your papers law, um, which would allow the police to stop and question people about their immigration status and um you know i don't have to tell y'all how hard it is to be a texan captured by these racist voter suppressing republicans it is beyond frustrating and yeah stephen in the comments is exactly like the arizona bill 
it was a co carbon copy almost. Um, so, you know, these, the folks that are in power right now are intent on criminalizing the existence of people like me and like our comrades, um, our brothers, sisters, and siblings. And they have so much to fear when the legislature is in session. You know, I, I feel like we're in this moment where the wave of activism that brought me to the chapter at the start of the Trump administration is starting to slow or change or morph in some way. And we have to be smart and strategic about how we shift as the political ground shifts underneath us. Um, and, you know, looking at the local terrain, I think we're starting to see the signs of a right wing backlash. Um, I know we certainly saw that with the Prop B campaign. So we have to do what we can to motivate our comrades and to take on the state leadership that emboldened far right reactionaries in our own backyard, propelling Mackenzie Kelly to city council and pouring, pouring millions of dollars into the campaign for Prop B. We must expand our organizing to the state level because that's where our enemies are contesting every good thing we win on the local level. If you've followed the news in the state legislature, you've heard some of these bad bills. SB6, the bill that would not only ban abortions at six weeks, but criminalize our feminist comrades that fundraise abortions for the working class. It's already been signed by the governor. We're gonna challenge it in the courts, but that's the kind of stuff that we're up against. Um, HB uh, 1200, the 1280, a trigger bill that would ban abortions outright if the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade is expected to pass later this session. Other bills come for Austin specifically um, and take opposition to things that we fight for here locally statewide, such as the HB 60 that goes after municipal funding for abortion support services, HB 1925, which bans public camping statewide, HB 1900 and SB 23, uh, that would reduce a city's funding by the amount that they defund their police departments. Um, two, uh, tonight as we meet, the Texas House is fixing to hear SB 14, which is also known as the Death Star Bill, an omnibus resolution, uh, which is a fancy word to say it's a big bad bill with a bunch of horrible shit in it um, that would take away protections for our queer comrades, water breaks for construction workers, um, who build in the Texas heat and preempt the paid sick days ordinances that our chapter fought so hard for. You know, yeah, they're coming for us. It's bad. Boo, <laughs> boo in your house. So like, this is class war. Like that's what it is. It's fucking bleak. Um, but if there's one thing I know about us as a chapter uh, and I know about y'all, my brothers, sisters and siblings in the struggle, it's that we are strong enough to fight back. Uh, some of you who joined during the pandemic may not have heard this chant echo in the streets of Austin yet, but I all of this stuff kind of has me wanting to scream. So I encourage you to chant in your house um, because sometimes we need to do that in Austin and in Texas, dealing with what we do. So the chant goes, um, when our community is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. And that is kind of the chant that I got to use. To, I used to say in the streets with y'all and has kind of helped me center myself as we engage in these fights because we're up against a lot, but we have to stand up and fight back for each other. There, no one is else is going to do it but us. Like we have to be the ones to liberate ourselves from the oppressive Texas regime that we are currently living under. And I think that we have the power to do that. I know comrades in this chapter are all capable of incredible things. I've watched us grow in strength and numbers to the point that we have shifted the political terrain in our city. And I know we can do it again. We're learning and growing all the time. We could have done better mobilizing around this legislative session, started earlier, built more intentional relationships with our comrades and other chapters around the state. But as we rebound from the pandemic, it, I'm certainly looking forward to getting into that work with y'all, holding more in-person events and canvases, trainings, rallies, all of it, because that's where our power comes from. It's our ability to move together as a group with a unity of purpose. 
So I really feel very strongly that we have the power to transform Texas. We've been doing it and we're gonna keep doing it to stop having to rely on Democrats to save us or to have a spine or to fight bad bills. We need to get socialist organizers into the Texas legislature and we can do it in a mass political movement type of way because that's what we're about. Because you know, having one AOC in the Texas ledge isn't gonna change Texas. Having a mass movement of an organized multiracial working class is going to change Texas. So we get there the way we always get there by putting in the work and being out there on the ground, having conversations face to face with regular working class people about our vision of Texas, of our vision of a more just world. Um, it's our duty as Austinites to show up when other parts of the state can't and to lead the rest of the state by example with the things that we fight for. Maybe we'll tell them it's progressive, but it's actually socialist. And the rest of the Texas will follow our lead if we take those steps. Um, our class enemies are organized, well-funded, and willing to wait years to undo all the things that we fight so hard for. So we need to start planning for how we will shift power in Texas uh, long term, not just three month, six month, one year campaigns, year long campaigns. When I talk about my commitment to building a more just world, I speak in the terms of years, decades, lifetimes. The systems we are fighting are entrenched and powerful and our enemies are committed to holding on to power. So we need to be thinking about how we can be committed socialist organizers, not just next month or next year, but in the next 10 years. We need to be talking to our comrades about industrializing, deepening our partnerships with our unions, and uh, just you know, figuring out how we can remain in the fight and in the struggle together for decades to come. So I'm exciting. I'm excited to see the work that this chapter does as we continue to think about how we can expand and grow, not just in Austin, but in all of Texas. So that's that's like my little soapbox. I think we're still gonna get together and figure out more of the broad details. But you know, for another chant, I can go, I believe, I believe that we go in. And I will hand it off to Jake. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Uh, so yeah, tonight I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, more broadly about the socialist movement today, uh, touching on some broader themes. You know, we've heard tonight about specifically what Austin DSA is doing, what, uh, you know, the Texas Ledge is doing, what we're doing about that. But I think it's worth, uh, especially in a moment like this, kind of zooming out and thinking about how we got here, where we go from here. And uh, I'm also going to be talking about why you, uh, everyone on this call and uh, everyone more broadly uh, should become an organized socialist. So uh, as Amanda was just talking about, uh, right now in Texas and across the United States, reactionary forces are on the offensive against voting rights, legal abortion, even the most basic workplace protections, um, and against a lot of the good things uh, that we have, uh, the few good things that we have in this country. Um, and it's it's certainly a grim state of affairs, uh, but we also know that it's nothing that we haven't that we haven't seen before. These same reactionary forces have been on the offensive uh, for more than half a century at this point, uh, vigorously working to roll back the gains made by the labor movement in the 30s and 40s and the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. What does distinguish today from uh, the rest of this half century of capitalist assault in the working class is the existence of a large viable socialist organization, uh, namely DSA, the Democratic Socialist of America, uh, which today has almost 100,000 members nationally, which historically speaking is, is pretty impressive. I mean, we're second, at this point, we're second only to the, the Socialist Party uh, in the, the day of Eugene Debs. Um, which had about 115,000 members at its height in 1912. So uh, I think we can beat. I think we can beat them pretty quick here. Uh, but yeah, as I said, in this historical moment, 
it's, it's worth thinking through what our tasks as socialists are. First of all, of course, we must defend the historic gains uh, that we've already won from the revanchist right. But we can't stop there because if we're merely, if we're always fighting rearguard battles against our deep pocketed class enemies, uh, that'll get us nowhere quick because these these people can, uh, these people have, have more money than God. And, uh, you know, and, and we can't just, um, we can't always uh, beat them, uh, especially in these in these defensive battles where we're uh, on our back heels. Um, so we too, at some point, have to go on the offensive. And uh, you know, fortunately for us, uh, being born when we were, uh, the left today is in a good position to go on the offensive. And we've already seen how even an organization like DSA, which is relatively weak compared to uh, left-wing movements abroad, and uh, you know, still pretty small in a, in a country of 330 million people, even though 100,000 uh, members is impressive. Uh, even, even an organization like that in the United States can achieve real concrete wins, and we've already seen that. So over the past few years, just to take the, the, the local view of things, Austin DSA has won many uh, such victories. Um, in 2017, we got a paid sick leave ordinance passed at the city level. Uh, we've elected Greg Kassar to city council and, and Jose Garza to the district attorney's office, both pretty big deals. Uh, and we also in 2019 uh, forced millionaire Democrat Lloyd Doggett to sign on to Medicare for all, um, you know, uh, much to his chagrin. Um, and these successful campaigns prove that dem democratic socialists can win when we organize around a positive vision of the future. Clearly, however, we're still a long way off from achieving socialist transformation in this country, uh, but I don't think we should let that discourage us. You know, we have to take it in perspective. DSA, uh, it, as I said, is the largest socialist organization in the United States in a very long time. And especially after two Bernie campaigns, uh, there are millions of people across the country who sympathize with our cause, uh, the socialist cause. And uh, so, you know, right now we're on fairly favorable ground to do a lot of big organizing and big political campaigns. And so really, I think the only thing left for us to do is to move forward, continue organizing and uh, bring hundreds of thousands of new people into the socialist movement. So as I see it, our historic task is as clear as day, and now it's incumbent on all of us to do our part in building that movement. But to get closer to this, uh, to achieving this historic task, uh, we're going to need to get serious about building the organizational capacity of DSA and creating an institutional left uh, that can broadcast socialist politics to millions of people. DSA is building a participatory democratic mass movement in which everyone has a part to play. And uh, as the old adage goes, an unorganized socialist is a contradiction in terms. Eugene Debs said that. Uh, it's, it's, it's good uh, on a basic level, uh, on a fundamental level, that there are many people who sympathize with the socialist cause. But if we hope to get anywhere, we're going to need a lot of those socialist sympathizers to actually get organized and start uh and, and and start and start uh you know join a socialist organization and start organizing themselves becoming an organized socialist fundamentally means throwing in your lot with the working class of the world taking your place beside them in the struggle for a better day and that's uh that's really what it's all about socialist organi organizing uh takes a lot of hard work and dedication but if the past 200 years of working class struggle against the capitalist class have proved anything, it's that when you organize, you can win. Uh, and there are, to use Jane McAlevey's phrase, no shortcuts to victory for us. So it's really something that we all have to do collectively. As Anna said, it's, it's about collective action. So just you know, now that we've gained a little bit of perspective maybe on where, where we are and where we go from here, uh, 
it's also worth looking forward. But looking forward, it, it's impossible to tell uh, what the class struggle will look like in five or ten years. There's no crystal ball that we can um, that we can look at. I mean, there would have been no way to predict to predict, uh, say, the the West Virginia teachers' strike in 2017 or the Black Lives Matter uprising last summer. Um, so yeah, we don't know exactly what is going to happen in the next few years. All we can know for certain is that uh, whatever it is, we as socialists will be in the middle of it, waging fights in the workplace, in the streets, and at the ballot box in order to build the capacity of the working class to self-organize and to advance the cause of socialism. And uh, the, the road to socialism will be long and hard, no doubt, full of bitter defeats and setbacks, um, some of which we've already experienced. But we know this struggle is worth waging because in reality, it's our only chance to one day live in a world free from the misery of capitalist domination and to create a world where everyone can, dignif can live a dignified life and achieve uh, the full human flourishing that they're owed. And uh, just to quote Eugene Debs one more time, because, uh, you know, uh, why not? Uh, he was he was a good speaker and writer. Th this is from an article that he wrote in 1908 in the lead up to uh, the presidential election where the Socialist Party gained their largest uh, vote share up to that point. And uh, he started, he, he, this is an article he wrote for um, a Chicago socialist paper. And he starts by saying, the socialist never sees anything but victory ahead. Even where the vote is small and outward indications might to the average beholder carry but little hope, the socialist sees nothing but ultimate triumph. The socialist is the greatest optimist the world has ever produced. And that's the end of the quote. But so with that in mind, I would encourage everyone here tonight to join us, DSA, in our fight for the ultimate triumph of democratic socialism, not only to pay your dues and uh, and uh, you know come to meetings, but also to start organizing and to uh, you know to take an active part in this movement because that's really the only way we can do it is by um, is by doing it all together. And uh, so you know when you and thousands of others like you take the step of becoming organized socialists, we'll have good reason to be optimistic for the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. That was that was great. Um, we love a good Eugene Debs quote. Um, really keeps you going on, you know, those tough, tough losses that we have to expect and prepare for. Um, next, we'll have um, our National Political Committee uh, member, Christian, uh, talk to us a little bit about convention. And it, this is the time, if you have any questions about convention, please feel free to raise your hand if you know where that function is or ask it in the chat. Um, although we're electing delegates and delegates will be voting on the resolution stuff, I think anyone can view the convention, so. Uh, yes, I am right here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, good evening. I'm coming from y'all, uh, coming to y'all from Dallas, uh, so not super far away, um, but really glad to be uh, in community with y'all tonight. Um, I actually just hopped off a um, Lincoln DSA call, um, so I'm glad to be back in like the central time zone because time zones are super confusing to me. Um, but anyway, um, I do have some slides. So I don't know if folks would want to, you know, sort of do that. So uh, you have something to look at. Um, I also just want to verify how much time um, I have um, just so I'm not going over. Um, if it's too much, I'll cut you off, but I think don't worry about it. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure, you know, I get to questions. So um, if I could get a warning. Also, if um, I don't know if someone would mind sharing slides for me. Um, I am notoriously bad at uh, multitasking with the slide shares. <laughs> um, so I'm telling on myself right now. But um, if I could send someone a link to share slides, I would very much appreciate that. Um, you could send it to me. 
Okay, thanks so much. Um, also, yes, the coveted DSA 100K fat. I, I feel just more official wearing it, uh, remembering the task ahead to 100K. Um, so as the slides come up, I just, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christian Hernandez. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I used to be the co-chair in North Texas, and I'm now on the National Political Committee. Uh, have a couple couple months left on uh, on the NPC, so uh, you know I I wanted to make sure that we we had you know conversations with chapters about what the convention is and what does it mean. Um, I'll probably go through maybe a shorter version of of this presentation, but uh, essentially want to make sure that for folks who are unfamiliar with what the convention is, just briefly touch upon what that is, um, go over what delegate responsibilities are, and then talk a little bit about the platform. Um, so maybe just a show of hands as we go to the next slide. Who here has been to the convention before? Um, I also admittedly, I'm like, I kind of can see. <laughs> um, so it looks like there's some folks, I've seen some folks have raised their hands. Uh, hello, Amanda too, shout out. Um, I, I definitely know Amanda was at the last convention. Um, <laughs> so uh, yes. Awesome. Uh, so it looks like some folks are, are pretty familiar, at least, with what the convention is. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about briefly what it is and why it matters. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So, so every two years, DSA hosts a national convention made up of elected delegates from every one of our chapters. I believe we're now at 244 chapters in all 50 states, which is amazing, huge. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and every DSA chapter is entitled to send a certain number of members uh, based on the chapter size. And these delegates are democratically elected to decide on resolutions, bylaws, and constitutional changes, um, and this year to vote on the national platform. Um, the convention does constitute our highest decision-making body with the NPC or the National Political Committee charged with making political decisions in between conventions. Um, and so there are also at-large delegates to the convention. I believe this year there are 100. Um, and while we typically host this event in person, uh, last year or two years ago now, it was in Atlanta, um, the convention is being held virtually for the first time due to the pandemic. Uh, it was a very difficult decision that we took very early on in our term, um, but I think ultimately was the right one. Um, but this virtual convention will also be the largest one to date. Uh, we are going to have 1,300 delegates from all over the country, uh, and that does not even include all of the observers, international guests, um, and that just to me is, is super exciting, definitely going to be a lot of socialist energy uh, in the virtual room um, come August. Now, why does this matter? Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. I, I think the convention is a big deal for many reasons, but one of the most important is that it is the largest display of democracy in our organization. Um, it is where and when we decide on our political priorities and our political leadership. And that is huge because it does affect the way that we uh, invest our resources, our staff time, and how ultimately we prioritize our work. Um, and obviously, you know, there, there are things that go into that, assessing the political moment, there are, you know, uh, cri different crises that pr uh, present themselves. None of us could have predicted that we would be, you know, making decisions in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, I don't know that many of us could have seen that, um, you know, Bernie was not going to make it and what that meant for our organization going forward. Um, and so it, it's also an opportunity for us to discuss our work from the previous two years, assess the current moment, um, celebrate our wins, um, but also reflect on our losses and stay humble in that and be being able to make sure that we're learning from the mistakes and missteps that we make um, to move forward more effectively in the future. Um, and I like to say that the convention is a reminder and a recommitment to a national organization and the power of that, um, the power that we are building, uh, which is super important. Um, again, we also are electing NPC members, which means electing members who will be operationalizing resolutions and making decisions in between conventions. Um, so for folks who maybe aren't familiar with the NPC, think of the convention as where members decide what gets done, and the NPC is the body that decides how it gets done and when based on the resources and the political moment. Um, and so uh, what does that mean for Austin DSA? Uh, you know, holding delegate and alternate elections is a huge part of it. Um, and 
while ultimately delegates will be the ones voting on resolutions and the platform, it is crucial that members in your chapter have the time and space to talk about how these resolutions would apply to your local work, what the platform means to your ongoing political discussions, and where you and your chapter fall in these decisions. Uh, we are a big tent organization, which means that uh, we will disagree, um, but it only helps to clarify our politics if we have these discussions and debates openly, democratically, and I think most importantly, with grace and respect for our comrades. Um, so if we can go to the next next slide um, for how to be a delegate, um, just some quick requirements. You do need to be a member in good standing through the beginning of the convention in August. Um, and being a delegate is a responsibility um, because it means you were elected by members to represent the chapter. Um, and you are going to have a hand in shaping the direction, politics, and tasks of our organization as a delegate. Um, you are expected to read through the resolutions and amendments compendium and the platform. Uh, both of these items are on the convention website and to my knowledge, the second iteration of the platform will be coming out in the next week. Um, and it is good to know where your chapter stands on these, but we also want to encourage you to keep an open mind about um, everything as we enter debate at the convention, keeping your mind open to having your mind changed is beautiful. It's liberating. Um, so just keep that, keep that in mind. Um, and then you will be, uh, need to be elected by your chapter. Uh, so no one can just like randomly <laughs> sign up for the convention. Uh, you do have to be, uh, elected. And once we get those names, we then send, um, you know, your, your chairs, basically the information to get those folks registered. Um, and then we also do highly suggest that you sign up for one of the four, three remaining pre-convention conferences. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so folks do have like generally a lot of questions about the convention. Um, so I wanna answer maybe uh, preemptively some of the main ones. Um, you can, uh, what is the time commitment? Um, and so I am sharing a link that has both the agenda to the pre-convention conferences and the ones, the one to the convention itself. Um, this is not like, I mean, some of these say like panel <laughs> uh, and that's not just secret. We're just still planning those out, uh, but that's more for folks to know that like, this is when we will have panel time. This is when we will have debate time. Um, and we are making sure also to incorporate as many breaks as possible because Zoom fatigue is hella real. And we wanna make sure that folks are, you know, awake, engaged, um, and involved in as much of the convention as possible if they're elected delegate. Um, and we do also want to encourage folks to not just sort of like, ah, well, we're only going to discuss things like Thursday through Sunday. So I'm not going to take part in the beginning of it um, because I do think there are going to be some really amazing trainings and workshops um, at the beginning of the convention. And honestly, anytime that we sort of can come together, uh, I always feel like the energy just ends up feeling folks, you know, just every, I always end up feeling super energized after um, talking to a bunch of uh, DSA members at any given time. Um, so does it cost money? Yes. Uh, thankfully, because it was it is virtual, we're going to be able to keep costs pretty low. Um, you are going to be able to register for the convention at a rate of twenty five dollars until June fifteenth, um, and after that, registration is fifty until it closes on July fifteenth. Um, you can, however, request solidarity funds if you cannot afford the registration fee. And if you have accessibility needs, um, you can request help with tech solidarity. Um, if you need internet, we will we'll be shipping out hotspots to folks who do not have reliable internet access. Um, there will also be cart captioning and interpretation available. Um, and if you are elected delegate and you have other accessibility needs that I did not mention, um, please feel free to email the email that I'm dropping in the chat um, to request specific things. Um, so that we're uh, making sure that you're able to participate uh, fully in the convention. Now, um, if you are not a delegate, if next slide, please, you can still propose amendments to the resolutions and bylaws changes. Uh, you have until June 15th to make any amendments and those require 100 signatures. Um, you'll also be able to make amendments to the platform, which do require a higher amount, 250, uh, and you have until June 30th to do so. Um, like someone mentioned in the chat, Sorry, I can't like, I'm like trying to multitask. I think that was Tandra. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, attend pre-convention conferences. So many of those discussions have just been super great. Uh, being able to talk to comrades about 
what these planks mean for us and our organization, for the ongoing work of the organization, uh, for growing the organization with intentionality, uh, I think is super important. So um, if you're not able to be a delegate or you don't plan on being a delegate, I definitely encourage you to attend our remaining uh, pre-convention conferences. And I am more than happy to share the link in the chat as well um, for folks who have not yet signed up. Um, and also if you, for some reason, missed <laughs> your pre-convention conference and had signed up, you can just re-sign up and we can make sure that you can attend. Um, so the last part is the national platform. Um, so this year our um, theme is from the ashes of the old, socialism for a new tomorrow. Um, and this theme was chosen because it evokes thoughts of the future, which is what we're trying to build. Uh, we are at the dawn of a new day in a couple of aspects with nearly 100,000 members, super close. We're a far different organization than we were only a few years ago. Um, and it just feels like a time to start anew. Um, we'll be voting on a platform again at the convention and I think for me that that's a signal that we're starting a new era in DSA, one with not only common goals and principles, but external ones, uh, which to me is sort of a testament to you know, the rest of the world. Like, hey, these are the things that we wanna fight for. This is what matters to us as socialists. Um, now the actual process itself, um, the platform and resolution subcommittee of our convention committee um, is the one that you know sort of took on this work of drafting um, and received a lot of feedback from folks, which is great. Um, I think they've they've been uh, taking a, a lot of time to really go through all of the things that members submitted um, as things that they disagreed with or uh, you know suggestions for improvements um, and, and really just so much information from folks um, about how to make sure that this platform felt collective um, and felt both comprehensive, but also, you know, relatively succinct because, um, you know, we want to make sure that folks actually engage with the platform and read it and are able to use this, um, you know, effectively and in the course of your organizing work just beyond the convention. Um, and I think I already mentioned that amendments require 250 signatures. Um, and again, so it's just important that uh, we understand that this is not the final um, platform, that there are amendments, um, and that we will be discussing all of this at length at the convention. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so I, I think I just want to be able to reiterate that a DSA platform grants us the opportunity to come together and create a concise and forward facing vision for the work of our organization and the world we want to have a hand in creating. Um, we can and should see it as a comprehensive goalpost or maybe like a, a roadmap, if you will, for the world that we know is possible and the world we are fighting to actualize. We're trying to make this real. Um, and it's important that the platform process be collective and that we as members take the time to provide input and feedback on the contents of the planks, not only as an exercise of democracy, but also because the platform will be voted on to represent our external political vision. And the platform represents a shared vision that DSA members have a collective ownership um, over an imperative. I think this is the most important part. We have a collective ownership over, but we also have an imperative to fight for. Um, so I think that's it as far as the convention sort of overview itself. I think I dropped some of the more important links um, in the chat, but um, I now can um, make myself available for questions if folks have any. Thank you so much, Christian. That was really great. Um, and I know a couple of those links, like the pre-convention uh, signups are also in the agenda if you lose it in the chat. Um, but yeah, if anyone has questions, you can raise your hand, um, get on stack, or just type it in the chat. Or we can just move on to the elections if all of y'all feel like pros on the convention after hearing about it from us for three months. Hey, that just means y'all did a great job of doing the rundown. Um, I, I will want to, I do want to plug one thing that is like convention related, uh, which if folks are, um, have checked their email today, we just released a membership survey. I don't know if that's been brought up already, uh, but if it has, I'm going to bring it up again. And if it hasn't, I'll bring it up for the first time. Um, we've already had over 3000 members submit the uh, membership survey. And, you know, that email just went out maybe a few hours ago. 
super exciting. We do have uh, a major goal of making sure that as many members as possible of our 94,000 members fill out the membership survey. Um, so I know I personally will be <laughs> talking to every DSA member I know to make sure that they're filling out that survey. Um, but that is going to be super important to the work of the GDC, which if y'all are not familiar, is the Growth and Development Committee that was tasked with making sure that um, you know, we get to 100,000 members, not only the numerical number, but also doing that with intention and acknowledging that, uh, you know, our organization does not yet represent all the segments of the working class. And we have a lot of work to do to make sure um, that we are a viable political home, especially for black and brown workers, um, especially for parents, especially, you know, making sure we're a multi-generational and multilingual space. Um, and so uh, I think part of that work um, is requ that's required is sort of having a baseline of understanding of where we are um, so we know where we have to go. Um, and so that's that's really, that'll be my plug for why the membership survey matters and being able to engage with it fully um, and comprehensively um, is going to mean a whole lot for the work that the GDC does going forward. Uh, so again, if you can take the time, it doesn't take super long. Uh, I mean, it's about the subject, you know, Best yourself. <laughs> um, and uh, so I would really, really appreciate uh, you plugging that. And if you uh, have social media and feel comfortable, um, you know, make sure to like let folks on social media know that you've completed your membership survey. Um, but anyway, thanks so much, y'all, for the time. Um, and, uh, you know, again, really great to, to be a lot among Texas comrades. Um, and yeah, good luck with the election. Awesome. That was so helpful and informative. Thank you, Christian. Um, next, we'll have Quinn give a quick overview of how the voting system will work. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, Quinn Heham. I'm the treasurer of Austin DSA. Um, we are doing our election this evening. Uh, you have until 11 p.m. to vote. Everybody should have an email in their inbox from no reply at opavote.com with a subject line opavote voting link. And in there, you will see a big button that says vote. When you click on that vote, you will be taken to a page that has a list of everybody who's running on the left and a blank slate on the right. The list is in random order on the left. And then you can click uh, in order uh, who you want ranked to uh, be on your ballot. And if you change your mind, you can remove people or you can drag and drag them around to reorder them. We are using what's called single transferable vote. Um, we posted a link earlier today and there should be a link in the email ballot itself to an explanation from Minnesota Public Radio that explains how it works. But the long story short is that uh, you have a single vote and it's transferable. Uh, and what that means is your vote will go to the person who is ranked first until that person is either elected as a delegate or is eliminated because they're in last place and nobody has reached the proper threshold. Um, so that means that you don't need to really worry about how much higher you rank somebody, somebody than somebody else. Um, there's not a situation where you can kind of strategically vote and it's not points. It's just your, your first choice either gets in or gets out. And then once that happens, it goes to the second choice. Now, there is a specific math that goes into how much of your vote goes to the next candidate that I'll kind of briefly explain. There's more in that video, but in short, if the person you are is in last place when nobody's won, your first, that, uh, that means that that person will be eliminated as a candidate and your entire vote goes to the next person on your list. So if you vote for candidate A, candidate A doesn't have enough votes, then your vote goes to candidate B. Now, in the other event where you vote for candidate A and candidate wins, they have enough votes to be elected no matter what. What happens is that everybody who voted for candidate A has a fraction of their vote go to their next choice. Um, so let's say, let's make it really easy. And let's say that candidate A got exactly twice as many votes as they needed to be elected. What that would mean would be that candidate B, uh, your second choice gets half a vote from you. And then everybody else who voted for candidate A who's now elected as a delegate gets half of the vote for what, whoever their second choice is. And that's really it. We have 26 delegates that we're electing. And that means we're going to uh, wait until everybody has enough that they are mathematically voted in and it'll be step by step by step. So uh, we will elect everybody who has enough votes. 
And then if nobody meets the threshold, then everybody who does not have enough votes, uh, who are so everybody's in the person who's in last place will be eliminated. Those will be redistributed, and that'll just be continued until we have 26 delegates. And then once that's all done, we'll rerun the election for five alternates. Um, and so that just uh, means that uh, your votes for the alternate are kind of like starting from the beginning. And that's really it. Uh, you do have to rank everybody. I know it's a little annoying. Um, you do have to uh, uh, spend the time to do it so everyone's votes counts equally. Um, but And the ballot will do that for you. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I think I saw some stuff in the chat. Uh, 